Now, one of the modules that's been proposed is that you know, the four entities of the UK agree to vo are voluntary members of a union. That would suggest that sovereignty rests in each of those component parts. And it would suggest that that sovereignty is pooled in certain areas where it's sensible to do so. Again, very radical model, but one I'm, I'm very familiar with. Uh, so from a Welsh perspective, it, the confederal model appears to be uh, more appropriate than any other. Hello, I'm Brendan Donnelly. I'm the director of the Federal Trust. Uh, the Federal Trust is interested in differing levels of governance, be they international, European, national or, or subnational. And today we're going to talk about the UK's national level of governance, but we're going to do it through, as it were, a, a Welsh prism, because we have two very distinguished Welsh commentators to join us today as guests. First is Carwin Jones. Um, welcome. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Um, you were from 1999 to 2021, Senate member for, for Bridge End. And from 19, 2009 to 2018, you were the Welsh First Minister. Uh, Glyn Dua jones is a, a prominent commentator on Welsh and UK constitutional issues. He's a member of the Institute of Welsh Affairs um, and favours, um, in a way that doesn't always commend itself to the federal trust, uh, a confederal rather than a federal structure of the United Kingdom. That's something I'm sure we'll come back to, to later. Uh, can I start by asking both our, our guests to get the conversation going um, what they think uh, uh, the experiences of, of Wales and, and Welsh de devolution um, can tell uh, the rest of the United Kingdom about the appropriate future development of the UK's constitutional structure? Um, are there specific um, lessons which um, the past 20 years have, have, have led you to, to draw um, from uh, from the Welsh experience. Can, can I start with you, Carwin? Uh, thanks, uh, Brendan. I think the uh, the message is that you have to get the model right from the beginning. That's not what happened uh, when we look at Welsh devolution. In 1999, uh, what was then the National Assembly for Wales was established. It was basically a council. It, it was a body corporate. It had the uh, structure of local government. It didn't have primary lawmaking powers, didn't have any... Uh, financial uh, fundraising powers. By now, of course, it's a tax varying lawmaking parliament, and that's been a long journey in the uh, 24 years since the uh, what was then the, the assembly. Now the Senate was was actually set up. So, get the model right in the beginning is the uh, the message that I would uh, I would offer. Would you agree with that, Glendora? Uh, yeah, well, there's a comment on it, if I may. But Glendora, you tell us what what your perspective on it is. Well, then, look, uh, you know, as Carol has highlighted, you know, there's been challenges since the outset. You know, if we look at uh, uh, you know, powers delegated to uh, to Wales, uh, you know, these have not entirely been respected by Westminster, particularly in recent times. You know, we've had uh, bills uh, that have had legislative consent uh, withheld by the Welsh and Scottish parliaments in areas such as the European Union bills, the UK Internal Market Bill, and the Subsidy Control Bill. There's also the Barnet formula. You know, we not really had an engaging, proper conversation about how things can be improved and made fairer. Rock Grant to Wales did experience a real reduction of about 11% between 2011 and 2020, and the funds are decreasing uh, going forward. This Brexit, uh, European funds would have been worth one and a half billion between 21 and 25, and there's a current shortfall of half, half of that figure. Um, I think the Scottish and Welsh governments have been positive looking for solutions, particularly greater flexibility in managing their budgets. But so far, uh, these uh, irreasonable arguments or reasonable debates have fallen on deaf ears. So the system, as it is, is not working. What best is operating badly, I feel. Isn't, isn't there an argument that uh, uh, British political culture is um, neurotically averse to anything which could be described as an overarching constitutional structure. The best you can hope for is to make incremental steps and the steps that were taken in 1999 um, allowed further progress to take place. Uh, isn't it possible to have a, a slightly more uh, pragmatic, or some people would say pragmatic view of the way that necessarily the British constitution works? Is, is that too pessimistic of you, Carwin, do you think? I think part of the problem is the asymmetry that exists between Scotland and Wales. Uh, in Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland has powers that 
we wouldn't want in Wales. We wouldn't want our own driver and vehicle licensing system, for example, that wouldn't give us any kind of benefit. But the biggest difference between uh, the Welsh Parliament and the Scottish Parliament is the absence of powers over justice and policing in Wales. It's still run from uh, from Westminster. Now that asymmetry exists uh, because there's no federal structure within the UK and because ultimately we are still beholden to parliamentary sovereignty. As long as that principle holds, uh, it's very difficult to uh, see any kind of permanence in devolution. In some ways, the powers are on long-term loan because they could be taken back at any time by Westminster. And when it comes to financing, there are two issues in Wales that are a problem. Firstly, the Barnet formula itself. Now, my Scottish colleagues would defend it, of course. From a Welsh perspective, it, it, it's out of date. Uh, and secondly, the way in which the Treasury operates, the Treasury is capricious. There are no rules governing the way that the Treasury sees things. It basically makes its own mind up as to whether consequential should come to Scotland or Wales. And there's nothing you can do about it. It just does it off the top of its head uh, with any kind of reasoning. So as, as well as looking at how powers are distributed, there's a desperate need to look at how money is distributed and the mechanism for doing so. It needs to be more transparent and certainly fairer. What do you think, Lindor, of the argument that uh, uh, that step by step is the only way in which British constitutional evolution can come about? And the things that Carwin's pointing to perhaps are, are things that can be achieved within the existing framework. Well, I think you're right to point out that evolution is uh, is uh, is probably the way forward, uh, balancing change with continuity. And I feel that uh, you know, you know, if we look at England, you know, an energised program of devolution within England would initially evolved, no doubt, uh, a fuller rollout of the directly elected mayors across its territory. But in time, the initiative could eventually develop the offer of devolved assemblies for the regions, English regions. But the fundamental architectural issue of, of today is, is that the administrations of Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland cover nearly 15% of these isles' inhabitants. And consequently, intergovernmental relations across the UK have become marginal to the affairs of Westminster. So any, as Carolyn has said, any new constitutional design must place weight on the structural relationship between the devolved governments as present and the government in London. In its, and this is the complexity, its dual capacity is that for the whole UK, making English laws. And I would hope that uh, once far-reaching devolution is enacted within England, much of the work of the English government will be taken away from Westminster, leaving it to focus on aisle-wide functions and objectives, addressing the issues, addressing the challenges around funding and uh, and uh, sharing resources. House of Lords, I think, as the Gordon Brown's Commission of the UK Future has rightly pointed out, uh, would benefit from representing the regions and the various regions of the nations in its uh, structure composition. But underlying all this, uh, you know, if we're looking at uh, moving or evolving towards a different future, it all at some point needs to be placed on a formal footing uh, through some form of constitutional framework. I and mean, there's many ways of doing these things. Um, at some point, we need to reach a point. On the formal structure, how, how likely do you think it's going to... to is it that, that the British political system can give, give birth to a, the formal structure that, that Gondor is very powerfully advocating? I think if I'm realistic, it's unlikely because if you're looking at a, a substantial constitutional change that includes England, which is often forgotten about, of course, in this uh, debate, that would require major surgery. You're talking really about uh, how England is governed. Uh, you would need some kind of, if not written constitution, you'd need constitutional safeguards, uh, which the second chamber could be part of. So I think the reality is that for example, if there's an incoming Labour government next year, the focus will be on the Brown Commission's proposals uh, rather than something more radical at, at, uh, at this stage. Uh, to move to something more radical would take a lot more time and I think would take a lot more thought in terms of what any kind of structure might look like. Um, what's your reaction to the, to the prospect of the constitutional menu over the next few years? Being, being the Brown Commission's rep recommendations? Do you think they're thin gruel, or or do you think they can be built on? I think they could be more ambitious, no doubt. 
Uh, certainly. I mean, you know, you look at the challenges within England itself and the North South divide, some of the statistics around that. You know, they do need to be uh, uh, packaged uh, into the debate. Uh, you know, economic activity is 3% lower uh, in Northern England than the rest of the nation. Uh, employment rate is 3 to 4% behind. So I don't think we can separate uh, uh, just the conversations in Scotland and Wales with that of what's required within England itself. Uh, it's interesting, of course, we have our parliaments in Scotland, Wales, uh, that uh, today uh, represent the democratic will on certain powers, on certain functions of the populations. Uh, I would hazard, I would propose that some of the difficulties we've had in more recent times is that Westminster's parliamentary sovereignty is indeed problematic and actually may be inconsistent with the model we have. Uh, you know, if... If, if, if the application of sovereignty lies in protecting the democratic will of a politically united society in which best suits it, then we have to acknowledge more formally uh, through democratic mechanisms that the UK today is structured across four parliaments. And that uh, of its own takes us, I mean, Brendan, I mean, it takes us into a very interesting area of, uh, uh, of federalism, or even confederalism. Uh, we all have our own views on this. Before uh, we... we go on to that, could, could I ask Carwin just to say a bit more about um, Westminster sovereignty? Uh, because obviously there are, as it were, pragmatic um, uh, administrative difficulties in what the new system would be. Um, but underlying it all, it seems to me, is is the problematic question of, of British of, of parliamentary sovereignty, which is so elusive, but so all pervasive a concept. Uh, how do you see the British political system as emancipating itself from that? I think the only, there are two alternatives to the current situation of parliamentary sovereignty. One is to limit it in certain areas, and that would require a form of um, a, a guardrail and oversight from the second chamber. But that, I mean, you either have parliamentary sovereignty or you don't. Uh, it's not possible, I don't think, to have limited parliamentary sovereignty, in which case it's not parliamentary sovereignty. Uh, but there is a way of doing it. And then, of course, the more radical option is to say there will be a written constitution. There are two ways in which you can organise a constitution effectively. One is you say you have one legislature that is superior to the rest, which is what Britain does. Although there may be a question mark in Scotland about that, but that's what Britain does. Or you have a written constitution which simply outlines what, what each institution does and doesn't have a hierarchy of legislatures, which is what the US does. The second option, uh, which a great deal of work, is far more radical. Uh, the first option, I think, is probably more realistic. The problem with Britain is that the British constitutional law is basically mainly made up of conventions. You could argue, if you wanted to be a minimalist on this, that there are two elements of constitutional law in the UK. One, there's a monarch. Two, there's a parliament of Westminster that can do what it wants when it comes to legislation, and that's it. The rest of it is all built on that. It's very difficult to build a lasting constitutional settlement while unlimited parliamentary sovereignty exists. Why? Because in theory and in law, the UK Parliament could abolish the Scottish and Welsh Parliaments if it wished to without any reference to the people of those countries. And while that's politically highly unlikely, obviously, we live in some very strange times. And unless there is some kind of guardrail put in place against that, then it's very difficult to see how, how solid any reform can be in the future. Yeah. Uh, is it an intellectual question as much as a political question? Is it an unexamined premise that parliamentary sovereignty is something which is a constituent element of, of British politics, of British constitution, and therefore is taboo? Do, do you see any merit? There's a bit of a fetish about it. I mean, let's, yeah. let's be honest. Uh, parliamentary sovereignty or supremacy, both words are interchangeable in this regard, is based on the view of one man, a Professor A.V. Dicey in Oxford in the 19th century, he invented the concept. And of course, why wouldn't the UK Parliament take that concept on board? If someone said to you, you can legislate as you want without any uh, interference from the courts, why would you say no to that? It's, it's not written down anywhere. And the great, uh, to my mind, the, the, the contradiction that exists within our system, which has not yet been put to the test, is that the, the Supreme Court would see itself as applying two fundamental principles. One, upholding the rule of law and two, recognising parliamentary sovereignty. But what happens if one clashes with the other? 
And that's never really been resolved in our system. Let's say Parliament didn't do something that was so outrageous and so against the rule of law. Uh, would would parliamentary sovereignty apply then? Or would the courts say, no, no, there, there is a limit to how far Parliament can go because this infringes on the first pillar of our of the principles upon which we operate, namely the rule of law. That's not been tested yet. Well, the Rwanda case, which uh, has been decided today, um, might further down the line pre generate precisely such a, a contradiction because uh, one of the tactics that the government may employ in order to uh, uh, challenge the turning down of their appeal this morning by the Supreme Court is, is to mobilise parliamentary legislation um, more clearly than they have up till now. That that could be an interesting constitutional clash. Um, you, you wouldn't. You would suggest, on the basis of the ruling today, that this got, that the Supreme Court is, is very mindful um, of needs for proportionality and reasonableness and uh, and basic competence, which um, haven't always been been, well, been shown. Let's bear in mind that what the Supreme Court decided today was mm -hmm. on the actions of the government, not of Parliament. And of course, the UK government is not immune from legal challenge. So. That doesn't affect parliamentary sovereignty. What the court has decided is that, uh, to my mind, from what I've seen, is that it's not unlawful to send refugees to a third country to be processed. It's a question of which country they're sent to. And they found that Rwanda wasn't uh, a suitable country for uh, refugees to be sent to for a number of different reasons. Secondly, the Supreme Court said that, yes, the Human Rights Act based on the European Convention of Human Rights does apply, but it's not the only part of the law. Now, there'll be cause, no doubt, in the right wing of the Conservative Party to withdraw the UK, join Russia and Belarus uh, as uh, countries who withdraw from the European Convention of Human Rights. But that isn't enough because the UN Convention on Refugees applies as well. Yeah. So but I, I suspect that the simplest way for the government to deal with this is to find another country. That will be seen as suitable and wouldn't breach the non refoulement rule that the Supreme Court has referred to. In Suella Braverman's letter, she pointed out that one of the um, uh, tactics she'd been pressing on the government was to have a greater parliamentary backing of the Rwanda policy. And it'll be interesting to see if um, Sunak does that. And if he attempts to do that, then that might set up a, a different kind of conflict with the Supreme Court. Well, of course, it's open to the UK Parliament to disapply whatever it wants. Yeah. Uh, traditionally, in our legal system, international law isn't incorporated into the law of the jurisdictions of the UK unless it's specifically done so by, by one of the parliaments. Uh, so if the UK Parliament would decide it was going to disapply the various uh, acts that have been mentioned today and disapply elements of the Human Rights Act, uh, it could do that. It could do that. And of course, be, then we, we come back to a situation where the UK Parliament is is cutting across any number of uh, of treaties that the UK itself has signed. What happens then? We to see what the Supreme Court's reaction would be in, in face of such a radical assault uh, upon international obligations. Shall we get well, they, they they would probably say if Parliament's decided that um, these issues are no longer part of domestic law, then we we can't we can't apply that. Uh, we'll just wait and see. Let's wait and see, Glendora, um I mentioned that your views about federalism and confederalism wouldn't necessarily commend themselves to everyone associated with the federal trust. Um, do you, do you, can you say a bit more about your view of uh, um, an overarching vision for the United Kingdom, which is a, a confederal one? I think when we take, you know, if we start from where we are and, uh, you know, we think in terms of the increasing need for devolution in England, uh, we think of where we are with four parliaments extant uh, in the nations, the different territorial personalities of the current arrangements that need to be taken into account when we look at further decentralization moving forwards, and especially putting England also into the model. It is, if we look at it on an island-wide basis, national devolution recognizes that the UK unitary state is a construct of formerly discrete national entities whose divergent histories and identities are currently acknowledged in national institutions. Decentralization within England is itself of the organization of power uh, within the nation uh, to better 
aligned decisions to local democratic concerns and demands. So it seems to me there's a two-tiered uh, um, argument developing. Your change must take account of these different characteristics of governance. Uh, uh, and through both, for me, the asymmetric nature of the UK can be addressed. Uh, and if we look at the relationships between Wales, Scotland, the parliaments of Wales and Scotland with Westminster, you know, they've become increasingly tested in recent times. It's why I feel a traditional model of a federal UK, where Wales might be the same basis as Yorkshire or Cornwall, is a difficult proposal, uh, especially in the Scottish context, I suppose. Um, and with the climate being what it is, you know, we need to look at a more interesting uh, model, a model that possibly uh, allows for a two-tiered system, uh, something which uh, uh, encourages, encourages uh, uh, devolution within England, but at the same time uh, puts the intergovernmental relationships and the democratic mandates that those institutions of Wales and Scotland already have on a firmer footing. And that, to me, leads to the application of sovereignty in Scotland, in Wales. And if you discuss things in those terms, uh, then you are moving towards a confederal model, if, if be it, a very close confederal federal model, not one which is, uh, you know, which is... Uh, is, is loose and with us moving apart. Yeah. Car Carmen, is that a, a vision that commends itself to you? Well, I think the problem with applying federalism across the UK as a whole is that you would, I don't know of a federal system where the component states, if we, to, if we use America, or the component lender, if we use Germany, uh, don't have the same powers. I don't know of any asymmetric federalism that exists anywhere. I think the from a Welsh perspective, of course, uh, we would see Scotland, Northern Ireland and England as a whole as being the equivalents, not in terms of size or population, clearly, but in terms of uh, political entities. And for me, it's a question of how you create devolution in England. If you were to federalise the whole of the UK, you'd be creating lawmaking tax varying parliaments in each part of the UK with, its, with their own legal jurisdictions. Uh, and in the case, I mean, if you were to take the Northern Ireland example, even looking at devolving employment law. So I think that becomes more problematic. And it's because, of course, that, that England it dominates the UK. It's 85% of the population. You don't have that dominance in any other federal system. And so England is the great problem uh, to, be, uh, to be resolved. Now, one of the models that's been proposed is that you know, the four entities of the UK agree to vo are voluntary members of a union. That would suggest that sovereignty rests in each of those component parts. And it would suggest that that sovereignty is pooled in certain areas where it's sensible to do so. Again, very radical model, but one I'm, I'm very familiar with. Uh, so from a Welsh perspective, it, the confederal model appears to be uh, more appropriate than any other. But that's not the way I'm sure that other people see it uh, in terms of uh, English regions, many of whom are much bigger than Wales. Mm. <laughs> Grindo made the point that that he would see a, see as politically problematic uh, a system, uh, say of, um, of of eight or or, or ten um, uh, English lender provinces, states, call them what you like, in which uh, in which Wales might be regarded as being the equivalent of uh, of Yorkshire. Do you agree that would be problematic? And and how would that relate to the German federal system where Bavaria? Which have had many centuries of an independent sovereign existence is 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 the equivalent of of made up um, lender like um, like well what what would it be um, North Rhine Westphalia? Well, people in Wales would not see themselves as being on a par with Yorkshire. Um, I understand the pride of the people of Yorkshire, of course. They're not doing Yorkshire now, but Yorkshire is part of England. Uh, Wales is a nation with a long history, with its own lawmaking powers, its own language its own fo international football team, its own international rugby team, which puts it, uh, I would argue, that's gotten on the head of the, of the English regions. And I don't see how, I don't see there's an appetite actually for, for example, Yorkshire becoming a le separate legal jurisdiction with its own law-making tax-varying parliament, because that's what would have to happen. It, what would have to happen is that the, the, the powers to each region would have to be the equivalent of, uh, of the devolved nation that has the greatest powers at the moment, that's Northern Ireland. Otherwise, the argument is you'd have a federal system where some uh, parts of that entity, federal entity, have greater powers than others. And that doesn't work. 
to my mind. It's either federal, where each component part has the same powers, a la America or Germany, or it's not, in which case it's a different kind of model. Uh, what do you what do you see uh, in the coming four or five years on the assumption there is a, a Labour government uh, as being the the real changes that will take place, particularly to the advantage or you would hope to the advantage of Wales um, in the the present constitutional structure of the UK. Well, I think we'll see more powers coming to Wales, but I think what is very important, which the Brown Commission has identified, is this idea of economic devolution. The UK is very very centralised in the southeast of England. That's where the money is. The bar formula doesn't work as well as it did, say, 40 years ago in, in most parts of the UK. Uh, so a lot of work needs to be done. It's one thing to devolve powers. It's another thing to ensure that money uh, is spread around as it should be. And the mechanism for doing that is is, is not transparent. It's uh, open to abuse. I'll give you one example. Uh, some years ago, Northern Ireland received a billion pounds when the uh, Northern Ireland uh, Assembly... Uh, once again reformed and that was completely outrageous uh, a lot of that money was for health and education it should have resulted in a barnetized consequential for wales and scotland and it didn't because the treasury just made it up on the spot that it wouldn't if we look at hs2 wales doesn't get a consequential for hs2 even because hs2 apparently is to wales's benefit even though it ends in birmingham which to my uh if i refer to a map is not not yet in wales uh it's that kind of capriciousness that is problematic on top of the UK government's recently found taste for passing legislation over the top of the Sewell Convention and not bothering to get the uh, approval of Scotland and Wales. So it's again, it comes back to this overbearing and secretive, frankly, as far as the Treasury is concerned, way in which the UK can be uh, can be organised. Can you explain? You 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 are a, a prominent um, Labour member. Um, how do you think it will be possible for you, if if, if it will, and your, your colleagues who take a similar view, um, to exercise uh, pressure, as it were, uh, on a Labour government, which may well be dependent upon, very much upon, upon English votes and English MPs? I don't think that what the Brown Commission has proposed is any difficult as far as England is concerned. In fact, I'd argue it's, uh, it, it's, over, it's beneficial. Mm. to many parts of England in terms of especially the financial, the economic uh, side of it. And, you know, Gordon Brown was very, very keen to make sure the economic devolution uh, was an important part of the uh, Commission's report. So this is not a question of taking things away from people in England, far from it, which the Barnett formula is sometimes represented as doing, even though it's not true. Uh, but it's a way of ensuring that even within England, that uh, there's a way of regenerating parts of England as economic uh, hubs once again, the northeast of England, Greater Manchester. I'm sure all those those parts of England would love to have that kind of economic power to make sure they, they can help to, to revitalize their economies. In at, the, at the moment, everything's centralized. Look at leveling up. The decisions are all taken in London. They're not taken locally. So in England, there's been a centralization of decision-making away from local entities. Well, that that's not... Entirely surprising, given the the flimsiness of the whole political project of of of, of, of leveling up. But but that's, that's by the by. Um, Lindor, uh, what are your expectations of of a Labour government um, that will be helpful to to Wales? And what would you be arguing for um, in, from a more detached point of view, rather than than Carvin's position firmly within the Labour Party? Uh, today, look, most people live in systems of multi level government, you know, encompassing local, national, and even supranational structures. You know, this is because different functions are best managed at different levels. Ironically, the majority of our debates, uh, deliberations, are really about which level of government does what. And uh, clearly, uh, you know, things should be decided at the level nearest to the people they affect, unless there's a good reason for them to be uh, kept or taken to a bigger level. Uh, whether within current structures or in a more imaginative future world. Uh, subsidiarity is a principle that's very well known. The evolution in Wales and Scotland is very, very, very popular and has a firm democratic mandate. The two electorates have voted in favour of extending, you know, we talk about evolution, extending devolved powers to the national institutions through referenda. And have consistently, if not overwhelmingly, supported pro-devolution parties. So this... Uh, uh, gives uh, those institutions uh, strong domestic 
uh, uh, positions a mandate to uh, uh, to ask or to uh, clearly advocate greater uh, functions, greater powers to, to to those nations. It's for me uh, probably a matter of how we frame the debate going forward. Uh, it does concern me that uh, you know much of the conversations are happening separately within the nations rather than the Isles. Uh, you know, debates rooted in the language of freedom and independence, maybe, is unhelpful. You know, why don't we reorientate and capture the vocabulary of collective and individual empowerment and solidarity? And I think Mark Drake has done very well, actually, in uh, using that word solidarity uh, in, in conversations. Um, you know, self-government on matters dearest to the people, of course, is natural, mm. as is the sharing of a few common strategic functions in uh, economics, security, and a few other uh, areas. Let's ask Carwin about the reframing of the of the of, of the debate. Do, do, do you see that necessity? Um, one of one to two of the things you you said have have contrasted what you see as the, the interests of Wales with those with with Scotland. Do you do you think that the two can be brought together? Well, the the one burning issue in Wales is where responsibility for justice and policing lies. Uh, there are other areas, but that's the one that's, that's provoked the most debate uh, over the past few years. Um, Scotland, Northern Ireland, England all have responsibility for their justice systems and policing. Wales doesn't. Uh, now that that's a matter for debate for the uh, for the future. There are some areas, uh, to my mind, that wouldn't be wise to devolve. And one of those areas, for example, is the welfare system. That's one of the areas that binds. Uh, the UK together, Northern Ireland is slightly different in a slightly different position, but nevertheless, it's something that binds the UK together. Having a separate Welsh benefit system would mean there's less money available, actually, because you know, we do benefit from a financial transfer in that regard from uh, from the rest of the UK. And I think Lindor is right. I think the debate has revolved around how do powers, what sort of powers and uh, should come to Wales if you're in Wales, or in Scotland if you're in Scotland. What the Brown Commission has looked to do is to look at the UK as a whole and say, OK, how can we create a model that works across the whole of the UK and is, and is creates a level of consistency across the UK and gives a voice to the English regions that frankly isn't there at the moment. Yeah. And I think that's where the debate has to change. How We've got devolution, and we know how that works, but how does it fit into the overall picture of the way the UK operates? Yeah. Lindor, um We've ranged quite widely. Um, let's finish by talking a, a bit about a, a written constitution. Do you think there's any possibility of that happening, say, within the next 10 years? I would hope so, or at least a greater formalisation of how we uh, how we work together. Because uh, there's been, uh, well, the current circumstances, personally, I feel that, uh, sustainable. And you know, we are also looking at a uh, structure where you know, the UK has withdrawn from one union as intensified debates in Scotland and Wales, whether uh, it should lead to the departure of, of those territories or do things more differently from the UK. Uh, when we look at uh, that and the need and the drive uh, uh, for those parliaments to uh, be able to exercise a more imaginative approach uh, to relationships, uh, even you know, even beyond the, uh, the, uh, the island context, that we are having to... Uh, uh, put certain safeguards and certain certainties, certainties, I think, into place. The current climate is a very uncertain climate. Uh, you know, things are done, or they appear to be done, randomly. Um, and if those entirely entrenched in the perpetuation of the unitary state are currently, uh, uh, currently constructed, remain inflexible, clearly the voices for a more radical and more uh, uh, separate conversations in, 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 in the nations become uh, become louder. We need to reach some form of compromise, some form of joint understanding uh, that uh, parliaments, governments uh, can make decisions for the future based on sound funding, based on the principle of equality and solidarity at the same time across the islands of Britain, okay. so that uh, we work positively for, uh, for future generations. Now, when... You seem to be favourable to a, a written constitution. Do you think there's any likelihood of it's happening in the last te next 10 years? No, I don't, I'm afraid I have to say. It. Yes, a written constitution would be 
easier, but we don't have a blank sheet of paper. If we look at written constitutions, they tend to occur after a significant shift of some kind. Uh, mm. Conflict in the US, mm. Ireland, Germany, uh, it, independence, Canada, Australia. Mm. Where, you know, of course, the irony is that people extol the idea of the British political system, but almost nobody else has actually copied it. Uh, and I think that's part of the issue. I don't, we've not had that, uh, and you know, let's. I don't suppose we want to see this. We haven't had that critical event uh, that is that would cause a written constitution to come into play, if I can put it that way. So I think we are we are stuck with what we've got at the moment. Uh, that doesn't mean that we, that we should have to live with untrammeled parliamentary sovereignty. And this is where, to my mind, the second chamber, an elected second chamber, and what it does is crucially important. You would have to give that second chamber the ability to examine and to my mind limit the power of the house of commons when it comes to uh amending constitutional statutes you have to define what they were to begin with but that's what the second chamber we should do it should be a constitutional safeguard uh, that would inevitably provide some kind of break on the unlimited sovereignty that in practice sits in the house of commons at the moment are there any other comments you'd like to make? We've had a, a, an extraordinarily rich and informative um, discussion. Thank you very much indeed for contributing to it. Are there any concluding remarks you'd like to make? Something we haven't covered, perhaps? Thank you, Carl. Thank you. No, I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you. I've, I've said lots, I think. <laughs> no, plenty and very, very interesting. Yeah. I think uh, if Carwin is happy, then, then we should all be happy, perhaps. Yes. Um, well, um, Richard Crossman once said that the British Constitution said what whatever the person with the most expensive suit and the loudest voice said it said. And uh, I think that's been something that's come up very interestingly in our discussion here, that that there's a need for greater certainty, irrespective of, of, of what the form um, of a future government, uh, the UK government mental structure may, may take. Um, Carwin, Lindor, thank you very much indeed. Um, our, I'm sure our listeners will will find your discussion very, very interesting. Goodbye. Hey, thank you. Good luck, Carwin, and thanks, Bernard. <laughs>